What page is that, bro? I'm looking at verse... <coughs> 1252, but I don't know. Oops. Verse 13. Okay. And I left my notes at home. Yeah. The king said to the king, the king said to the king, the king said to the king, the king Now list those people that are sitting close to the king at the feast. Karshana, Sheka, Admata, all these names have meanings in the Midrash. Why he uses the name? Tarshish, Meres, Marsana, Memuchan. So they're all sitting with him. <coughs> Who is the one sitting furthest away from him? Vakaovela, those who are closest to him. Karshana, Sheta, Admata, Tarshish, Meres. Marsana, Memuchan, who is the one sitting furthest from him? Memuchan. Memuchan. What does it mean? What does it mean when someone is sitting farthest away from the king? Yeah, the, least. the least. Yeah, it's the least important of them. The one who sits closest to the dignitary is the one that's most important. The one who sits further away is the one who's least important. <laughs> What's hap- what happened right before this scene? Right before these people are sitting with him, Khashvagosh summoned his wife Ashti to come undressed. And she said no. And now he's reaching out to those who are sitting with him. These are the seven princes of Paras and the ministers that see the face of the king. They want to know what should I do with the Queen Vashti? She did not listen to the words of Achashverosh when he summoned her. Who jumps up to speak? Vayomer Memuchan. Memuchan says, in front of the king and the minister. Vashti, she didn't only offend you, dear king. Also, she heard us. That all the nations, all the people, everybody that is subservient to Hashem will now know. Now the words of the queen will be known in front of their wives. That their wives will now know to disrespect their husbands. That he summoned his wife Vashti and she did not listen to him. God forbid. Don't worry, politically correct it's not. Mukhan. The Gibran says Tana. Memukhan hu Haman. Memukhan is another name for Haman. He's the same person. Oh. So how come Haman is at the far end of his favorite advisors? He's he's not the favorite advisor. He's the low life. Haman is the like the, the bottom might. of the barrel. He's the the tail of the lion and the head of the foxes. Mm. That's who Haman is. So the mm. king asks everyone a question, and who jumps up to speak? Haman. 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 That reminds me of rhymes of stain. The peanut gallery. You know the peanut gallery. Yes, we know. Haman is the peanut gallery. Nobody's asking you. Shh. <laughs> asking the important people here. Haman jumps up. Says the Gemara, Mikan, from here you learn shehahidiot kofetz barosh. The the ignoramus, the the foolish one, is always the one who jumps up to speak first. Right. Wise people think. The one who has all the solutions, all the answers, all the time, he probably is not the wisest one here. In the Megillah, it's written in Mum Khan. But we read it Mem Khan. Mum Khan spells out Mum Khan. There's a blemish in this one. Oh, Mum. Blemish. Mum. This one has a problem. This problem is his arrogance, his ego. He's speaking. There's a halakha in general. When you do something, when I was going to marry my brother off, my younger brother, he asked me to do his wedding. So what do you answer when somebody asks you to do your wedding? What do you ask them? I'm not worthy. No, I'm worthy of doing weddings. No, that I mean, that's... What do you ask when a person says, will you do your wedding? What do you ask them? You sure you want you to do it? Well, I don't know. What, what do you ask them? You tell us. Who are the other Tamil Khalim that are going to be at the wedding? Oh. oh. 
Who else? That's a, that's a Who else is going to be there? She just tell me names. Rabbi David Feinstein, Rabbi Ruven Feinstein, Rabbi Kamenetsky, Rabbi Dada, all these names. So you're afraid of upending somebody? And I said, I said, uh, it doesn't make sense, I should do your wedding. I'm your brother, I love you very much, but you have some big guns at the wedding. Uh, let's not say there's official seniority, but there's seniority. I mean, there are big rabbis, big names. Uh, I'm not, none of their students, but these are some of the chamim that we recognize from the chamim. You should ask them to do your wedding. Yeah. And he said, no, my sister, I really want you to do the wedding. I want a Sephardic wedding. Da, da, da. I said, who cares Sephardic? You get married by... The... Okay. And so I said, listen, I'll agree to do the wedding if you'll take a letter to Rabbi David Feinstein for me. I wrote a letter to Rabbi David Feinstein. I said, dear Rabbi David Feinstein, uh, my brother Ariel is getting married. He would like for me to do his wedding. I would like for you to do his wedding. And um, please... If you agree that I can do the wedding, just be mochel on your kavod. Forgive me that I'm, I don't intend to step in the place of great people. And he laughed and uh, reached out that it was okay to do the wedding. It didn't seem a big deal at all. Was he part of the family in laws? Uh, yeah, there was also. Oh, Rav Duff Duff was part of the in laws. He, he wasn't just family, no. Rav Duff Feinstein was in my wedding also. Uh, from my wife's side of the family. We have a few connections in this uh, okay. community. And so I felt that it was important to... Yeah, that's different. To, it was the, he is a, he's a rabbi of the neighborhood in which my brother's oh, in-laws live. That's totally the... Different situation. This happens often, even in San Diego. It's, forget Rabbi David Feinstein or big rabbis. I, somebody, there's another rabbi there. Go ask the other rabbi. I'm not... You know, for some rabbis, they get very offended when you don't let them do the wedding. Other, I don't care. I really don't. You know, so much work and effort and energy. I don't make any money from doing weddings. So it's not... There's no reason for me to, to work so I let somebody else have the cover and I'm happy just to be at the wedding and dance and you know and drink, eat some cake with you. I don't have to be the one doing the chuppah. So I reach out. A person has to know who are you sitting with? Where are you? In which audience are you? If you have a group of lawyers that are sitting around together and one guy is not a lawyer and then a legal question comes up and that's the one and that's the one who jumps up to answer the question. It tells you something about who they are. A little bit we're not trying to put you down. It's not a, we're not trying to be elitist over you. But you're sitting among people who know what they're talking about. Let them talk first. If you have what to add, you're always welcome to add. But first allow those who are greater than you to speak. Sometimes in our parents' issue, I don't know if you ever had a chance to watch any of these videos. They're in Hebrew. But sometimes it gets very frustrating for those of us sitting over here in California watching. Because there are students there. Who are the students that are sitting there? Newbies. Yeah, they're the ones who didn't graduate yet. Some of our parents says something. We already heard. We know this answer. We know what to argue about. And he's trying to teach something, and this, this little kid is jumping on him. Now, Peretz, in his humility, he always answers, answers the question. They'll start over and over He did the same thing for us, so I'm happy he's doing it for them. But for us, it's not, she's like, shh, if you would let him talk a little bit, you would understand more of what he's trying to tell you. You don't even let him speak before you ask questions. But you also said sometimes he can be very direct and don't ask me that. Sometimes the person, the question they're asking is, is irrelevant, or it's off topic, or it's wrong, or it's flawed. In the Bemilash, in the Ben Midrash, everything is fair game. And people can't come to the Ben Midrash uh, with the fear of being offended. On the other hand, Chachamim also say, that a strict person cannot be a teacher. And a, a, a person who's too bashful is not able to study. And you need a little bit of directness, also a little bit of kindness. Then. The Ben Midrash, the ben Midrash is a, it's a fascinating model for the world. So in what is his move, his blemish, that he's always jumping up to talk first? Just look how many people. Look how many people that are sitting in front of you that they should have spoken first. Haman jumps up first. So Haman becomes the one who takes responsibility for everything in the story. Interesting. There's a halakha like that also. <coughs> When we deal with a matter in the Sanhedrin of life and death, where do we start the conversation from? All the way from that side. Why that side? That's what the smallest of the is. Yes, he's a member of the Sanhedrin, but he starts first. Why? So that he doesn't base his opinion upon what people of greater stature than Correct, because if the head of the Sanhedrin <laughs> says something, everyone else might feel compelled to follow or... or they might be afraid to voice their opinion. And because of that, we always start with the smallest in the Now, 
for some people that's offensive. Why do you start with why do you tell him he's a small bricham? Everybody do that. When you're sitting on the Sanhedrin, you have enough humility to know who is the head of the Sanhedrin and who is the newest member of the people in the Sanhedrin. And based on that, we start off answering the question. The same thing happens here. And so there's the Gemara that says that with life and death, you start with the biggest one. There's a reason for that conversation, not for today. But in terms of Mimukhan, he jumped up and showed us something about his personality. It doesn't show something about the king. Yeah, sure, sure. But you have another here. That's exactly the next point. Lo ala melech levado avta vashti hamalka. He says, Vashti, the queen, didn't only hurt you, dear king, he hurt us too. The king is complaining about being hurt. Is it that Chagetz is saying you got offended also? Haman, why are you busy sticking your nose in this business? King, it's not bad enough your wife didn't listen to us, to you. She also is embarrassing us. Shh. What are you? This is a king you're talking to. Again, Haman, Haman, Haman. This is, a, this is a Haman. And notice how he calls her, by the way. He calls her Vashti Hamalka, Vashti the Queen. What does Achashverosh call her in verse 15? What is what? Achashverosh, what does he call his wife? What should I do with? Hamalka Vashti, Queen Vashti. Mm-hmm. Haman calls her Vashti the Queen. Why? Because uh, when you express it like that, it means that she doesn't deserve it. Hashvah uh, listen, remember that my queen, she's still a queen. Let's try to find a way to judge her favorably. His whole desire was, let's try to save her life. <coughs> I'm angry, so you guys help me save her life. Haman jumps up. No, she didn't just offend you. She offended us too. So it's not just about you. It's about us too. And then he calls her Vashti, like she's his friend. The whole purpose here of Haman is to deride the the king and the kingdom. It's like the difference between saying doctor someone and someone the doctor. Correct. You're losing stature and cover in the process. And and this is, by the way, (laughs) it's intentional on the end of Haman. The reason being... A king is not allowed to forego his honor. The reason being, his honor is not his own honor, rather. It's, it's, it's the honor. national honor. It's the honor of that office. And what he's trying to tell <coughs> Achashverosh is, Achashverosh, if it was just about you, you'd be able to exonerate her. But Achashverosh, it's not just about you, it's about us too. If you're going to make a move to exonerate her, you're going to destroy everything in this kingdom. Even the people in their houses are going to become corrupt because of this. And so a man is forcing a Hashverosh to do something against his will and to kill his wife or at least to banish her in such a way that he never really wanted to do it. Before you go on, could I ask you just a small question? You said that Haman is Memu Khan, but there's nothing that I can find in the text that indicates that. And then it talks about Haman separately. How do you know they're connected? Chachamim tells us that, that Nimuchan is Haman. So if we were not to accept the oral tradition, then yes, you're right. There's no textual evidence that that is uh, Haman. And Haman is a troublemaker. So for us, it's the same personality here. And it's making trouble later yeah. on. Well, I mean, uh, but no, but you're right. From the text itself, though every one of these names is a, is a nickname for something else. If you read through the Midoshim on these names, you'll find that none of these names actually means... They mean something, but they don't, they're not a person's name. They mean other things, like Admata, means earth. Hmm. There's a conversation here between the angels and the Baruch Hu, look, the Jewish people, yeah. who built an altar of earth for you. Yeah. There's all kinds of things like that. Whenever we see names that have these codes, we always assume that they're nicknames for somebody else. Mm-hmm. We do this with the 12 spies also. And there's a few things like that that are uh, indicative that perhaps this name is not what you think it is. All right, we'll continue to get out tomorrow. Let's do...